Hello, everyone. I'm Suhas Pai, the NRP stream owner at ACE, and I welcome you all to this session. So if you have been watching our recent videos, you know that we have been inviting a lot of great authors to speak about their papers. But if you look at our uh, older videos, you would know that we used to host weekly community-led paper discussion sessions at locations in the city of Toronto before the virus that shall not be named wrecked havoc on our lives. A lot of people mentioned to us that they missed those sessions. So this is one of our uh, to replicate that experience virtually. So to, to discuss today's paper, I have with me Royal Sequera, who is a machine learning developer at ADA.support. Uh, hello, Royal. Hey, hey Suhas. Um, hey, everyone. Hi. Uh, this is the first time looking at my face because in the limited interactions I had with me, I'm always uh, <laughs> uh, down. But anyway, hi. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, here's a fun fact. Our names sound very different, but we speak the same native language. It's a really lang uh, rare language. In fact, the dialect of that language that I speak has probably just around a million speakers around the world. So this makes us both interested in low resource languages and low resource tasks in general. So we'll be hosting a talk sometime next month on cross-lingual methods and low resource tasks and the like. Um, I'll share a set of interesting resources on that on the YouTube channel later on. And uh, you can check out our website to see when the session is actually going to be. Um, but let's come back to today's paper. So today's paper is about Pegasus, a state-of-the-art abstract abstractive summarization system by Google. This paper is uh, being presented at ICML 2020. And to be honest, its state of the artedness is already kind of in dispute because the field moves so fast. You know, uh, I personally love the task of abstractive summarization because to solve it, the systems need to have both extremely strong natural language understanding as well as natural language generation skills, uh, which may not be true for something like machine translation. So I know I'm opening a can of worms by making a statement like that because I haven't dis defined what the word understanding means. So we'll just drop it there. Anyway, it's customary for the moderators of ACE events to use the phrase without much further ado while passing on the baton to the speaker. Uh, in my case, I guess I spent so much time talking myself that I should say after way too much ado. So anyway, so here is Royal uh, laying the smack down on Pegasus. Hey guys, uh, thank you for the introduction, Suhas. Uh, and today we'll be talking about this amazing paper called Pre-Training with Extracted Gap Sentences for Abstractive Summarization by Google Research uh, and uh, cutely called Pegasus. Uh, and before I talk about what Pegasus is, uh, I thought maybe we can spend a minute or two just talking about what the task is. And uh, the task that they are uh, looking at is called uh, abstractive summarization. So given uh, an article, uh, there are two ways of summarizing. One is the extractive summarization, where uh, you, you take uh, relevant parts of the article, and then you copy this part as it is uh, and form a summary. So that's extractive summarization. And it's slightly easier compared to abstractive summarization, where in contrast, uh, you would have to come up with novel words and phrases uh, and it's mostly human-like and uh, yeah, so it's mostly, it's slightly harder summarization task compared to extractive summarization. So that's about uh, what the task is. And uh, talking about some of the previous techniques, um, historically uh, summarization has been done uh, using encoder decoder architecture. So uh, autoregressive language models, for example, wherein you would have huge amount of pre-training data and uh, you know models uh, like encoder decoder based uh, architecture based models uh, they would learn um, uh, the, the pre-training task here would be to to predict the next token and then once the 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 model is trained on this huge amount of data later it would be used for down, downstream tasks and of course uh, these architectures have uh, issues like long term dependency and so on and hence um, as we all know, you know uh, the NLP world was introduced to uh, transformer-based architecture. 
Uh, and the way transformers do language modeling is very uh, is different in the sense that uh, it's language modeling, but some of the words, uh, the, the, the set of words that are uh, given as an input to a transformer model are masked. Uh, and the idea here is uh, by masking certain percentage of the words in the input sequence, that the and by making the the architecture predict what are these uh, these mass tokens are, uh, the idea is the model learns uh, relationship between different uh, words or tokens. So uh, yeah, so that's about what um, the community has been doing so far. But the the interesting question here is our task is summarization. Uh, when the task is summarization, why should we be doing mass language modeling, right? Uh, that is, shouldn't our pre-training objective be much more aligned with the downstream task, which is at a sentence level, rather than using something that is, you know, like mass language model? So, so what Pegasus does is they propose a new, uh, a novel pre-training objective that is better aligned with the with the down, downstream uh, task. So, what is the what is the the better pre-training summarization objective? A better pre-training objective that Pegasus uses, right? So, it's called uh, gap sentence generation, with where uh, a set of given a set of sentences, uh, you mask uh, a fraction of sentences instead of tokens, and and the transformer architecture predicts what these uh, or tries to generate. Uh, these masked sentences. So, so in this case, Pegasus is mythical, and it names the model. These sentences are masked, and and uh, and the model predicts uh, these sentences. So, so I, the idea here is by masking the important sentences, and by making the uh, during the pre-training step, by making the model uh, generate these sentences, the the model. Uh, learns to aggregate uh, information based on whatever is available uh, and, and thereby learns the relationship between sentences and also gains an ability to generate. So this is the, the architecture as presented in the paper. Uh, so you see on the left-hand side, this is the uh, in our uh, general uh, transformer uh, bird-like transformer, let's say. So so here, if the input sequence is Pegasus is mythical, it is pure white, and so on. Uh, first, uh, some sentences. So, so here, uh, it is pure white is must, and, and it is represented by uh, mask one. So that represents a sentence mask. And after which, uh, some of the tokens are, are randomly masked. So Pegasus is mythical, the, the token mythical here, and uh, uh, I can't see it, uh, and it names the model. Names is is masked here. So, 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 so here the mass language model, like historically, predicts the the mass tokens, uh, whereas the the transformer decoder uh, it predicts the the target text that that that's masked uh, originally. So that's the uh, gap sentence generation. Any questions so far? Um, no questions from the audience, but uh, I would like to point out uh, a few things. So this idea of having your pre-training objective being very closely aligned to the downstream task has also been explored in a few other papers. So, so for summarization, uh, gap, um, Gap sentence generation is seen as one that is very close, but uh, there are some other papers that have come around uh, the same time that have tried similar uh, aligned tasks for other tasks, for other downstream tasks. Uh, I'll just uh, share one of those papers on the YouTube chat for your reference. But uh, for example, there was a task of acronym detection. Uh, and where the task is basically, if you have a span of text and you have to check whether it contains an acronym or not, uh, and where the acronym is fully spelled out. So the pre-training task for that, which 
kind of is very aligned with this downstream task of acronym generation is pseudo acronym generation, pseudo acronym detection, sorry, where they take a bunch of Wikipedia text, a span of like two to six unigrams, and concatenate their initials so that they can generate positive examples for the, the acronyms, right? So the, because the first, the initial uh, letter of each word, they form the acronym. And then they use it as a pre-training objective where you try to um, predict the existence of a acronym based on the labels that uh, you have used. So um, there are many other, uh, if you, uh, so Amir has a question here. If you align the objective with the task, doesn't it limit the generalizability of the LM to other tasks? And it's a very good question. This is the trade-off that we generally are grappling with. So if you have a generic enough uh, pre-training objective, it can work reasonably well on a lot of tasks. But if you want to push the boundaries on a particular downstream task, then it it makes sense. And by looking at the results, you can see that it's probably wiser to have more specific pre-training uh, objectives. And where, how will this trade-off be resolved? Uh, that is something we are still exploring. But uh, yeah, uh, that's where we are at the current state of the art. Right, um, yeah. Yeah. All right, so maybe uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I will move on to the next slide. So here are some of the data sets uh, that are used for pre-training Pegasus. Uh, so there are two data sets. Uh, one is C4 and huge news. Uh, and C4 is a colossal and clean version of common cause. So this mostly represent, represents um, you know, uh, internet data from the internet. Um, so it's crawled data, uh, whereas huge news is uh, mostly news and news-like websites. And you can see it's already a uh, like, huge amount of data set that, that goes into uh, pre-training this model. And uh, so that's just two. But uh, for downstreaming, they use 12 different um, uh, data sets. And uh, all, all of these data sets are uh, abstractive summary data set, uh, abstractive summarization data sets. Uh, so, each of them are what each of them are different from uh, one another. So, for example, extreme sum XM is our extreme summarization. Uh, these are uh, this is a BP, BBC article data set, I think, and uh, all the summaries are professionally written. Uh, and uh, for example, Giga word is uh, just by looking at the first sentence uh, of the article, uh, the task is to generate the headline uh, for that article. So that's the task in Giga word. Uh, Whereas archive and PubMed is, uh, you know, looking at the entire paper, the introduction body, and so on, um, body of the paper to generate the summary. And uh, for WikiHow, look at paragraphs. So, so WikiHow is usually step-by-step -step guide, right? So, looking at these paragraphs generate a summary. And uh, and uh, Reddit Tfue is, uh, I think this is a. They say that this is a really hard data set too, which is. Um, you know, like really short summary, like a TLDR of uh, of recent AI machine learning papers, uh, and then you know generate these summaries. Uh, so those are the twelve abstractive summarization data sets that they use. And uh, here are some examples. So if we look at this, this is uh, extreme summarization, uh, and these summaries are are, are uh, gold gold summaries or reference summaries. Uh, so you can see that. Uh, it seems like much harder task for a model to build these summaries. Uh, similarly, we have um, TLDR. So this is, like I said, um, you know, machine learning, deep learning papers. So you see, the, this this document is much bigger, uh, but you see the summary has words coming from different part of the the document, not just you know abstract or conclusion and, and so on. So uh, so you would have to keep track of uh, all the content that's present in the entire document. As well as uh, novel words that are not present in the document at all. Exactly. And and make sure you generate a sentence that is comprehensible and, and, uh, and sounds natural. 
Yeah, so the other one uh, is GigaWord. So here you see it's just one sentence uh, of the article that's present, and, and you generate summary uh, based on just that one, one sentence, or the first sentence of the article. All right, so, so what uh, Peggy says, I mean, the, their approach is because there are so many things to check, like uh, what fraction of sentences should be masked, or uh, what is the effect of pre-training data set, and so on, something that we will discuss in more detail later. Uh, so what they do is they begin with like a base model, just like, for example, BERT base, right? So they begin with a base model with like uh, 12 layers and uh, you know 768 uh, hidden size and so on, a uh, much smaller model. Uh, and uh, and then they, they go through a set of experiments um, on this smaller model, and then based on their learnings on this smaller model, they train a much bigger model. That is, for example, uh, in this case, I think uh, the slide doesn't mention it. They move from a batch size of 256 to 8,196. And, and here in, in uh, Pegasus Base, they don't go through uh, the entire data set that is present. Uh, they just go through a part of the data set and uh, and they do the, some of these experiments that we will be talking in the next slides uh, on uh, for not the entire 12 downstream tasks, but uh, downstream data sets, but uh, uh, just four of them, XSUM, CNN Daily Mail, WikiHow, and, and Reddit. So that's about the overall um, uh, paper, like a general idea of the paper, and uh, and now we will be discussing uh, experiments. But do we have any questions so far, Sohas? Do we? Uh, I guess uh, nothing in the chats. OK. But um, I think uh, maybe a few other things to mention about the training process. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, some of the interesting things that I found in the paper is that they actually tried several methods. For example, they tried first using the mask language modeling mm -hmm. objective along with the gaps and tension generation objective, right? And then uh, they, they, saw, they noticed that it didn't, uh, that in the final mm -hmm. model, uh, it didn't, that wasn't the most uh, optimal way, but right. yeah. But I think the way that they selected the tokens for the master language model, that was uh, interesting. So they just selected the 15% tokens in the input text. And out of those 15% of 80% 80, 80 of the uh, time, uh, those uh, tokens were replaced by a mask token. And 10% of the time, they were replaced by a random token. And 10% of the time, it was unchanged. And uh, one interesting point is that when you are using only masked language modeling as the pre-training objective, the transformer decoder shares shares the parameters with the encoder when fine-tuning fine -tuning on downstream tasks. Um, because of, I think, yeah, in the initial slide, you can see why it is, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and they also use ADA factor as a, as the optimization algorithm um, and greedy decoding for the decoding part uh, using a beam search uh, along with the length penalty uh, for the model. And one interesting thing is that for the small model, for the base model, they didn't uh, go through the entire corpus. Uh, they only used 500k steps in the training. Uh, uh, training data. Um, I, I mean, find it uh, steps for uh, training. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm curious about a bunch of things. So the biggest, I, I mean, one of the uh, most significant hyperparameters is probably the gap sentence ratio, right? How much, mm -hmm. how many sentences are you going to mask? And mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, what are the what do what do the experiments say? What does the paper say about it? Yeah, so that's a that's an interesting question because um, if you mask, let's say, just a little bit, right? Like let's say fifteen percent or like ten percent of your sentences, 
then it's uh, it's computationally efficient. You can train much faster. But if you mask way too many sentences, then it becomes much harder for the model to, uh, uh, you know, like the generation becomes much harder. So, so in this case, so this is the experiment that they do. They try um, anything from 15%, so 15% of masking to 75% masking. And uh, dip like different data sets show different results. Uh, for example, for extreme summarization, 30% masking seems much better. Uh, whereas for uh, wiki how you know uh, forty five percent seems much better and so on, but in the end, so this is on the uh, Pegasus base model, uh, but in the end they decide to uh, decide to stick with the thirty percent of uh, gap sentence ratio uh, for for their uh, larger model. Yeah. Um... Sorry. Uh, so is that clear? I, yeah, that sounds pretty clear. Uh, I'm also wondering about, OK, so we have this strategy of removing uh, sentences, right? Uh, masking mm -hmm. whole sentences. But the, now the question is, which sentences do we remove? Like, mm -hmm. for example, you can think of a random strategy Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you have a slide on this, so yeah. uh, that's nice. I think you can. I came prepared uh... to us. <laughs> huh? I came prepared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I came extremely prepared. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. So the, I think uh, selecting by random. I guess that sh uh, that's probably the least optimal method. Uh, I think one thing they did, did was select the first few sentences mm -hmm. and uh, that is the lead thing but right. the other thing where they did was calculate the rouge using the rouge metric to select the optimal sentences or basically select the sentences that are most representative of the document that is that is most uh, likely to be part of a summary right yeah i think so like you said what they do is either remove you know we can mask uh, the top M sentences, or mask uh, randomly M sentences, or mask the important sentences. And that's what principle in this uh, means in this slide. And what they say is, OK, so, so Rouge F1, which we can go maybe uh, slightly more deal uh, deeper later. Uh, so, so that's for now, we can think of this as like a metric that shows the importance of a sentence. And um, so, so we will mask sentences based on their importance. And, and the importance is computed by using Rouge F1. So now when, you, when we calculate Rouge F1, they, they go through different configurations. We can, uh, when we calculate this uh, importance uh, uh, in a Rouge F1 metric, we can either consider sentences sequentially, that's what seek means, uh, or we can consider sentences independently, uh, that's what IND means. And, and when you calculate the, the uh, the importance of these uh, sentences. Uh, so this is essentially like an n-gram overlap metric. Uh, so you can double count for some tokens, and you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, if you if you just want to look at the unique tokens or unique n-grams, and that's what unique stands for. And if you stick with the original implementation where you calculate sort of the overlap, uh, and uh, that's what uh, original uh, implementation or orig uh, stands for. Is, is that clear? Yeah, that sounds clear. I think maybe we can uh, dive a little bit more into Rouge. Yes. Um, yeah, so Rouge is this metric for abstractive sum uh, or for text summarization generally that is kind of um, inspired by the blue metric for that is used for machine translation. And it's, it's, it's pretty old, but it's been used for a really long time because, of course, developing evaluation metrics is really hard because if you had a really good evaluation metric, automated evaluation metric, then you had, it's then it would imply that you have already solved the natural language understanding task, right? So the Rouge uh, metric is mostly based on uh, using overlapping n-grams. So in this case, what happens here is you take a single sentence 
and then you take the rest of the document and then you see the number of overlapping words um, divided by the total number of words so uh, it, it there are two configurations so it's either unique or original in the sense that in the unique configuration uh, the tokens are taken as a set and uh, in the original one um, the tokens yeah their tokens are as is and so rouge generally is like there is rouge recall there is rouge precision and then there is rouge uh, f1 and yeah and this uh, what, what this uh, this paper is using is basically uh, Rouge F1. Um, I, I think one more thing that I feel is quite important here is, uh, or for any uh, is the tokenization strategy, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm curious what tokenization st strategies worked and what did not. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, so so they do two kinds of tokenization. Um, one is the, you know, uh, the byte piece uh, encoding that, like, you know, Bird, for example, uses. And uh, the other one is sentence piece. And, and in this graph, for example, you can see Unigram. That's, that's uh, essentially sentence piece uh, that represents sentence piece. And uh, they try different vocabulary sizes uh, from 32K to uh, 256k and and these are the results and and you see again uh you know i mean the results vary for different different data sets but uh in the end they choose sentence uh, sentence piece with 96k because that seems to be performing uh you know overall better compared to other other kinds of tokenization so so they go with uh, this particular tokenization option so us Mm -hmm. So you say that um, they eventually end up using Unigram 96k, right? Yes, for like the, the larger model. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Mm, I think um, for other, no, for uh, fine tuning, mm -hmm. and especially if you are trying to use this model in a real world setting, Mm -hmm. Abstractive summarization, it's really hard to find label data sets. I mean, it's mm -hmm. really hard to construct these label data sets. And for me, as a, if, as a practitioner, I would really like to see a model that, that has very good sample efficiency, mm -hmm. that you just need a few hundred, a few thousand examples, labeled examples to fine tune and be done with it. And, and uh, how does this model hold up? Because I think for practicality, that's like a really, really important uh, consideration. That's that's very true because I think when when we discussed the previous slides, I also mentioned, for example, you know, extreme summarization, right? These summaries are written by professionals, and, and like you said, all low resource languages may not have access to that kind of summaries, right? So this is one of the the biggest contributions of, or one of my favorite parts from uh, from this paper, maybe. Uh, and uh, so here, this I guess is for this this thing stands for Tulu, which is like a low research uh, language spoken in. Uh, it's actually uh, people say it will be endangered in a few years. It's a language spoken in my hometown in Mangalore in India. And uh, yeah, so uh, what is interesting here is um, so you can see that they perform uh they they use transformer base model and they do full supervision uh from you know uh, i think 20 the entire data set which is essentially you know uh, data sets that have 20k to 2200k examples so that is the uh, that's the amount of training data that they use for transformer based supervision uh and that's uh that those are the dashed lines uh Okay, and and uh, the different colors are different versions of root, so we don't really have to pay much attention here. Um, the the solid lines are both uh, sorry uh, Pegasus large model 
fine-tuned on either zero samples, which is zero shot, or uh, 10 samples, 100, 1K, and 10K. So what we see here is very interesting, and it's consistent for all 12 uh, data sets, that with about, let's say, 1K samples, uh, the uh, the with one just one k samples the the Pegasus large models that are pre-trained with one k samples they perform uh, as well as or better than uh, than a transformer based model that's that has had full supervision uh, and it's really amazing I think uh, and and also we will see in some of the later slides that the the um, the summaries that are generated with these one k samples are also uh, are nice. They're qualitative, qualitatively, you know, not just in terms of rouge, but even in terms of uh, qualitative results. There, they are. They look good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, speaking about rouge, um, it's it's definitely an imperfect metric because what I look for in a as an evaluation metric, for what I look for in a, in a summary, basically, is I look for linguistic fluency. Mm -hmm. I look for semantic coherence. I look for ex efficient compression. That is, a summary should contain the compressed version of, of whatever it's uh, summarizing. Mm -hmm. And I look for, uh, basically, being on point. And the Rouge metric, apart from the last one, it just doesn't really uh, account for any of these uh, other more important uh, factors, right? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it kind of, um, how can you really trust a model just by looking at the root score? Mm -hmm. Don't you think? Uh, uh, so I, I think you need human evaluations too. Uh, it's, uh, it's very kind of, necessary to look at human evaluations as well and mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm glad that this paper included it uh, mm -hmm. included a lot of uh, human evaluations so we can see for ourselves right yeah um we can talk about uh i think the human evaluation you know uh, experiments i also wanted to mention along along uh, since we are on this thread some of the other uh, experiments that they did before they moved on to Pegasus large model. Uh, for example, they looked at, um, I think, you know, what is the effect of corpus, right? Um, so, so, so we discussed earlier, uh, for example, there is huge NIRS and there is C4. These are the two pre-training data sets that they use. So what is the effect of these data sets on, on the down downstream task? So, so you see in this slide, uh, for example, that if you have um, huge NIRs as your pre-training corpus, then the, uh, the if the, and if the downstream uh, data set is uh, is news related, like extreme summarization, like we discussed earlier, is BBC News and CNN Daily Mail, uh, CNN slash Daily Mail. So you see that in these cases, uh, the these uh, data sets perform better with huge NIRs, uh, whereas in comparison. Um, you know the other other for other tasks uh, like Reddit uh, and WikiHow, which are more like website and uh, like internet related data. So you would you would rather use C four. Um, so so they see that there is you know the pre training corpus also matters, uh, and uh, and for their all their subsequent experiments too. Actually, uh, with even with their Pegasus large model, what they do is they decide to test on both. Uh, they they decide to train Pegasus Large on both C4 and huge news corpus. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm. yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much. And maybe uh, we can now. Uh, oh yeah, so there's also the I, I can show so as the final results on the downstream task, and then maybe we can move on to the human evaluation. Mm -hmm. So, so this is the their uh, results on downstream task. Um, you see, like I said, they have Pegasus Large on huge news and Pegasus Large on C4, 
and then uh, previous state of the art, and then they have a uh, Pegasus-based model, the, the smaller model that we discussed, and uh, and then they have a fully uh, full supervision with transformer-based model. So we we see that for news-related corpora. Uh, oh, by the way, the metrics are Rouge One, Rouge Two, and Rouge L, uh, uh, and uh, Rouge, Rouge One, Rouge Two, Rouge L F, F, F one measures. And we see that for Pegasus large, uh, sorry, for uh, news related uh, data, uh, the Pegasus model, Pegasus large model that's trained on, uh, uh, pre-trained on news corpora, like huge news performs better. And uh, for uh, Wikihub, Reddit, et cetera, archive, et cetera, uh, Pegasus large trained on C4 uh, performs better. But I mean, the slide is pretty easy to see that uh, overall, Pegasus Large is uh, you know beating the state of the art, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of state of the art, um, so there are uh, several models that for abstractive summarization that have uh, come in the past few months. Mm -hmm. I mean. Um, so I'm not sure we can say state of the art. Um, no. Yeah, mm, it will. <laughs> uh, so there's this exciting new architecture called ProfitNet, mm -hmm. um, which does, mm, which basically is where you have pre-training objective is not just a simple auto regressive language model where you just predict the next token. But it's a look ahead kind of thing where you predict the next bigram or the next ngram basically, and it's doing a it's doing quite good. There is also Bart, and Bart is kind of released at the same time as Pegasus, and it's also from Google, right? If I'm not wrong, yeah. Um, so. Bart is yeah, and it's also the implementation of BART is available on Hugging Face, so it's more widely used. And I like how BART uh, does this, uh, because they kind of use something similar. So they use a denoising uh, objective where they, um, where they have this encoder, which basically acts like BART, where you um, use a arbitrary noising function to remove a set of tokens. And then you have this decoder, which is a more like a auto-regressive um, GPT-2-like model where the entire document is basically regenerated. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a really interesting yeah, that's a really interesting model. And uh, I haven't seen comparison of those models with Pegasus. Mm -hmm. And yeah, mm, and also I'm curious to know about its sample efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, there are many other ideas, like the information bottleneck principle. Uh, we actually had an ACE talk about it. The author of that paper actually gave a talk a few months ago. So there are quite a few interesting ideas, and we'll only know um, in a few months, or I don't know, this, when the when things become more clear to see mm. which task, uh, which model, uh, and which what is the direction that researchers need to take. Um, I I'm, yeah, I'm now curious to see the uh, human evaluation. Actually. Yeah, sure. Um, um, and I think we can do it in the form of a Turing test because <laughs> yeah, uh, so-called Turing test because um, it will be interesting to see if the uh, if the summary generated by the model and the reference summary if you can distinguish between them. All right. Okay. Time for some Turing test. Um, we were thinking, uh, Suhas and I, we were thinking, we will show you the original article, and then we will show you uh, the, uh, we, we will show you two, two um, sa uh, summaries. One is generated, one is the gold summary or the reference summary, and the other one is uh, that was produces, produced by models. So you will not know which one is which, but uh, 
uh, we it would be nice if you can guess uh, which one is the summary generated by the model. So here is the first one. Uh, you don't really have to look at the entire article, maybe, but you just can read the the first uh, uh, summary and the second summary. And can you guess which is the summary predicted by by the model? I mean, generated by the model. You can probably comment and say whether it's the first one or the second one. So, has what do you think? You you don't know the answer to this one, too. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think the second one is model second generated. Second one is model generated. Probably. Okay, so, mm, so yeah. first one, first one. Yeah. A lot of yeah. Sorry. It's, it's, uh, okay, so it is actually first one. And uh, okay, what about what about this one? I will probably keep track of uh, the comments oh, yeah. so that yeah, we have a Turing test winner too. at the end. Uh, I think. This is hard. This is very hard. Um, wait, I. I don't think the both both the places are not present in the actual document, right? Yeah, both of them are. That yeah. is interesting. I think I forgot which one is true. I mean, the next slide uh, has it, but it's actually really hard. Uh, okay, I will reveal it in the interest of time. Hmm. I guess. I guess it. It's the first one, actually. I guess it's the second one. No, yeah, in this case, it's the first one. And mm -hmm. uh, what is interesting is okay, maybe maybe after this slide, I will I will reveal it. This was uh, this this was one of my favorite. Uh, I, I think this is easy. Okay. I think this is easy uh, because. I <laughs> I guess uh, looking at the positioning of the codes, uh, the second one is the one generated. Wait, why do model. you think so? Oh, position of the codes. Ah, don't you think it could have been, you know, the mm -hmm. model could have learned to position it like that based on whatever? No, I'm an AI skeptic for the most part. So I'm an AI pessimist, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I don't really believe in AI being that smart. Wow, OK. So so you're saying second one is uh, machine generated. Uh, Russell Polari says the first one has poor grammar. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think hmm. current language, state of the art language models have better grammar than the average person. <laughs> better linguistic fluency, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so as I'll reveal the answer, so it's actually the second one, and I was, I really like this uh, example too because, and and I think consistently we see that um, the model is coming up with shorter summaries, like even if it is by one or two words, uh, shorter summaries compared to human uh, ones, and it's really mm -hmm. nice to see that I think. So maybe in the interest of time, we can uh, uh, go through. We will not spend much time. Yeah, uh, but I think. Yeah, I think yeah, I think we can, uh, I am really interested in uh, in looking at the symbolic reasoning aspects. Okay, okay. So this is uh, let me just finish this one again. This one is the first one, much much smaller. Okay, so so you want to you want to know the black magic part of it, right? <laughs> All right. So here's really another very interesting part of the paper. Very impressive. And uh, so, so here's a puzzle for uh, all our viewers. Uh, let's say, can you can you guess what's happening here? You just have to focus on these top three sentences. So this, uh, your clue is in here, 
uh, hopefully you haven't read the blog but uh, yeah if you haven't then it is better so the clue is here and then these are the summaries so looking at the summary can you guess what's going on and so here's the first slide and then in a few uh, moments i'll show the next slide Yeah, can you see it? Okay, maybe I'll move to the next slide. So as I can actually see it on my window, so probably. No, I can. Yeah, I can. I, I think. I, I think I know what's happening. Okay. Um, you can see. Here's the other other slide, by the way. It's, it's, it looks like it is counting. Okay. <laughs> no, it looks like it's counting, right? Yes. Uh, because, for example, you can see that you have four frigates or frigates and then the model summary has the word for even mm. though there is no mention of the word for mm -hmm. anywhere and again in the right hand part of the slide it right. is five. five even though there is yeah so this leads to the conjecture that the model may be counting yes um although i think it was also mentioned that it can count up to five but when you add one more, uh, it uh, it's incorrect. It says seven instead of six. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? Uh, how is it able to um, get the number right there? At least for a few. Years? What is happening? I am actually. Um, very, how is the symbolic reason going? I'm I'm actually optimistic, and I agree with what the blog says too. I think uh, that the model actually is showing some ability some you know prelim primitive ability of counting it probably knows how to count until five uh but doesn't know how to count six or seven maybe uh yeah you, like you mentioned when six ships are present it counts it as seven um but uh i think i think it is counting w what do you think um as a skeptic i i guess it's um so for example it can pick up cues from the commas. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just looking at, because it's trained on so much data. And there are so many instances where you have these commas, and the commas then just present numbers, because they are referenced somewhere else using numbers. And you can learn that. Mm -hmm. I it can, yeah, I guess, I guess that's what's happening. And uh, it's not able to do it beyond five, just because. Uh, there aren't uh, as many uh, examples in the pre-training uh, set for larger numbers. So yeah, yeah I think that's what's happening. Uh, I also remember there was this paper that came last year, um, and they had like a cheeky abstract. And the, mm -hmm. at the end of the abstract, they wrote that the abstract was basically generated by the um, by the paper. And um, I think. To generate a very, uh, to generate such a realistic abstract, um, you have to think that most papers are structured in a particular way, where mm -hmm. you, the, yeah, the abstract of the paper can be kind of generated from the paper just by looking at a few particular sections because they all have a very common format, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Russell says that uh, hard to say if it generalizes from an example, but it probably picked it up on the repeating pattern. But how often do people list more than five comma separated things? Yeah, I think so even for... I guess I guess that's why you are not able to um, count beyond five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was I was thinking some ways we could you know check for 
um, whether it's actually counting or is it like memorizing maybe or like you know uh, like you were saying right maybe come up with like a b c d or something uh but i think even in that case you could argue that it knows to detect these commas and and therefore uh probably count but yes something that maybe we you can come up with different tests or like come up uh, take you know look at the uh, auto vocabulary words and uh, and put them here instead of these uh, shifts maybe and see if the model can still uh, you know detect or count maybe mm -hmm. yeah um, i guess let me ask if we have any questions from the audience i can also meanwhile show what is the the the, the interface mm -hmm. that was to the uh, the human evaluators so this is how, how it was shown so an article would be shown to the uh, to the human evaluators and talkers and each of these summaries one of them is like a gold summary uh, the other one was uh, you know based on um, uh, what is the word? So, so the the Pegasus pre-training model was was pre-trained on C4. The other one on huge news, uh, and the other one is uh, birth based fully supervised. So, so four summaries in total, and they were randomly presented, and and the the MTurkers did not know which one is which, and and they had to they had to pick uh, and say or like they had to rate uh, which summary is better. And uh, and here's also the results on um, uh, human uh, human versus Pegasus. So you see that, um, for example, with extreme summarization and and CNN Daily Mail, for example, uh, the summaries that are generated uh, with Pegasus Large as well as Pegasus Base, they are uh, pretty qualitative and comparable to human generated ones. Even with the low resource setting that is the case for for, for these models um, but they say for reddit it's not really the case like you know the the summaries are not as great uh, and that's mostly because this data set inherently is harder uh, and uh, and they say that reddit data set has you know diverse writing styles and, uh, and and therefore it is it's much harder but like full supervision is much much worse Yeah, so that is everything. Uh, so, has did you want to give more details about uh, Rouge score or and the algorithm, maybe? I guess. Yeah, probably. Um, I guess one of the things about, that I wanted to mention about Rouge. So, I think here you have seen earlier in the earlier slides Rouge R one R two. And RL. basically, they, they refer to unigrams, bigrams. So it's basically a number of overlapping um, unigrams, overlapping uh, unigrams or bigrams divided by uh, the total number of words in the uh, reference summary or and the total number of words in the uh, system summary. So I think uh, one thing to remember is we're, we're talking about Rouge F1, right? And how do you calculate the Rouge F1? It's through, you need the precision and recall. And how do you calculate the the recall? So it's basically the number of overlapping words divided by the total number of words in the, in the reference summary. And for precision, it's basically number of overlapping words divided by the total number of words in the system generated summary. And then you take those two, you get the F1 as the Rouge F1. Yeah, and then the maybe uh, I have an example here. Uh, we So in addition to Rouge 1, which which is like unigram overlap, and Rouge 2, which is like bigram overlap, there's also Rouge L, which is the co longest common subsequence uh, overlap. So. So let's say S1 is the reference summary or the human generated summary, and S3, S2 and S3 are the candidates. Uh, so, so in this case, police kill the gunman and the gunman kill police. We would prefer S2 over S3 because 
uh, this has longest this has the longest common subsequence with the reference summary. So so rouge uh, L is essentially uh, you do the overlap, but you do the overlap with respect to longest common sequence. And and like Suhas was mentioning now, uh, you calculate precision um, or recall and, and F1 and, and you use that as a metric. Mm -hmm. mm. So we're, we're also supposed to do a, <laughs> do a code review. I guess um, it's also the end of the hour. So maybe we'll defer that to something, uh, some other session. But uh, I, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope uh, uh, you found value in it, I guess. Uh, kind of, but uh, we decided that in the end, we probably will not find the time because there's so much to cover. And also the fact that a lot of the relevant code that is most interesting is written in C++, which I am not sure would be the best kind of um, language to walk through in. So I think, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So, what? So, someone is saying C plus plus is okay. So let's do a night out and <laughs> do the next two hours. Spend the next two hours. Anyone? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I guess. I guess no. Um, so, what? What? What is next? Uh, next, we will be back in the NLP stream for another session on cross-lingual methods. So there is a benchmark called Extreme that is made up of nine different tasks for 40 different languages, 40 different languages from all over the world, low resource languages. And it's exciting. And using cross-lingual embeddings, cross-lingual transfer techniques, etc. Is, is such a booming field right now, and we would like to cover it. So uh, I don't know the exact date, but uh, we'll be there. And so long, everyone. I hope anyone who was playing the drinking game of taking a shot of water every time we said state of the art hasn't collapsed by now, because <laughs> I think we should use that term a, a lot of times. And I want to mention that we didn't do it deliberately. Uh, at least Royal didn't know this, right? Did you know that I typed no. type that? <laughs> no. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, we'll have to leave you. I hope you have a wonderful dinner or any other thing that you are doing. So, bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Uh, bye.